it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do exactly what it says I can do. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. I'm a doer. And not just a hearer. This is, this is, this is the word of faith for my life. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And I shall be all the better after having heard God's word. Come on, put a praise on it as you remain standing. Amen, amen, amen. The word of God this morning is found in three places. We're going to hope and pray that God will join them all together and make this message make sense. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, where we left off on last Sunday. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, the book of Psalms 119, verse 38. Psalm 119, verse 38. And finally, based on that song we just heard, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. So for those of you that are taking notes, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, Psalm 119 and 38, and Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And we're just going to put them together and read them together. It's one giant pericope on the screen. So here we go. One, two, three. Let's read. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power and work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we may ask or think. I want to talk this morning from the theme, the keys to victory, the sequel. Look at somebody say, the, the, tell somebody it's got a sequel. Tell somebody it's got a sequel. The keys to victory, the sequel. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise as you go to your seats. Eternal God, our Father, we just ask for your anointing, your blessing, your peace, and your power upon this word. Sit there and blow down there, Lord, let your spirit stand up in me. God, please don't preach and teach a good word, but preach and teach a word that will do us some good. Let it touch, let it heal, let it deliver, let it lift the word, loose the shackle, let it set somebody free, let it save, let it sanctify, and also let it edify. In the name of the Lord Jesus, somebody holler, amen. I, I want to talk this morning from the theme, the keys to victory, the sequel the sequel, the sequel. So, and even if you weren't here last week, sometimes the sequel may be better, it may even be better than the original. This, this message is not necessarily one of information, but it's one of impartation. So tell your neighbor, God's got something for me in the house this morning. So, so, so it, it may, it, there may be some sharp curves, there may be some bumps along the way, but God's got something for you in this message. As a matter of fact, tell somebody, there's at least one sentence in this message for me. At least one, at least one. When, when we left off on last week in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, when we left off on last week in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, uh, uh, John the apostle heard the angel say to him, it has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night, and they defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. Yeah. And we had a good time on yes the last week talking about how the blood plus your testimony equals victory. Tap somebody and tell them you need to hear that. The blood plus your testimony equals victory. And then it went on to say, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. In other words, they weren't so worried about their reputation. They weren't so worried, much worried about what other people were going to think that they weren't willing to do what God told them to do and say what God told them to say. But it's interesting that the Bible says here, it says the accuser of our brothers and sisters was thrown down. But guess what? As saints of the Most High God, we no longer need to have to worry about an accuser because once the accuser got thrown down, the advocate stepped in. Oh, somebody missed that. Let me say that again. Once the accuser was thrown down, the advocate stepped in. That's why 1 John 2 and 1 says that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus.
Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. I think somebody is missing what I'm saying up in here. Check this out, beloved. The accuser who has been thrown down and the one who remains is an advocate. An accuser tears down and destroys, but an advocate supports and promotes. Somebody needs to know that Jesus has been talking you up before the Father. Oh, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I need somebody to know that Jesus has been talking you up before the Father. Jesus been saying, our advocate works in your favor. And is there anybody here who knows that Jesus has been working in your yeah. favor? I need somebody to know that the, the only job that Jesus has, Dr. Danita, right now is to work in your favor. Until Gabriel blows the trumpet, he just sits around the Father yeah. and says, Father, I know they're tripping, but I died for them. Father, I know they messed up, but I died for them. So God still made the way. So God still opened the door. Is there anybody here who can lift your hands and thank God for your advocate before the Father? Somebody shout hallelujah. Look at your name and say, I have an advocate. I have an advocate. I have an advocate. But look at this, Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. It says, then the dragon tried to drown the woman. We established more last week that the dragon was Satan. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth. The woman represents the church and those who came to Christ, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. Is there anybody in the river who has this testimony? It seemed like you were about to drown. It seemed like you were going to go down for the third time and the last time, but all of a sudden help came from an unusual place. Is there anybody here who's ever had God use all the resources of heaven and earth to work in your favor? Somebody shout hallelujah. But y'all, this is the point. This is, well, this is one of the points that I want you to miss. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 17, it says, and the dragon was angry with the woman and declared war against the rest of her children. Who are the rest of her children? All who keep God's command and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Let me say that again. The dragon was angry. I need somebody to understand that the enemy is angry because God keeps protecting you. The enemy is angry because God keeps making a way for you. The enemy is angry because God keeps opening doors for you. I need you to know that the enemy is angry at you. And understand, beloved, sometimes the only way you can know that you're doing it right for God is that you have the enemy on your tail. Is there anybody here who's had the enemy on your tail? I need you to know that that's proof positive that you're living right for God. Because the only time you run into the enemy is when you're walking in a different direction of the enemy. Somebody shout hallelujah. So here we go, look at this, look at this. The Bible says that the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children. Somebody say, all. Who oh. keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Understand, beloved, the enemy wants you and me to stop talking about Jesus. Let me say that again. Rook a rook a rook. The enemy wants you and me to stop talking about Jesus. He wages war against those who hold on to the testimony of Jesus. Is there anybody here who says that we just got to fight because I cannot let go of my testimony about Jesus? Is there anybody here who can say like grandma and them, he's done so much for me so I cannot tell it all. Has anybody ever heard a war about a war of words? Know this, beloved, the enemy is after the very words that you speak out of your mouth. Let me say that again, rook a rook a rook. The enemy is after the very words you speak out of your mouth. Let me see if I can help somebody here. God is not at war with the devil. The devil is not God's equal. The devil is a created being. And the devil was defeated on Calvary once and for all. So God is not at war with the devil because the devil has been defeated. But in his short time, as Revelation says, his time is short. He is at war with those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. You see, the enemy doesn't have a problem with you when you don't talk about Jesus. The enemy doesn't have a problem when you don't tell anybody what God can do. But when you start testifying of how good God is, that's when the enemy's going to try to shut you up. But is there anybody here who's made up in your mind, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I, I'm going to tell everybody how good God has been to me. Somebody shout hallelujah. Is there anybody here who's ever seen God do financial miracles in your life? 
can, can, can I just testify for a moment? Can I testify for a moment? My wife and I were in a service maybe about three or four years ago. And the pastor said uh, over the microphone, the pastor at this church where we were, he said over the microphone that the Lord told me to give $1,000 to a couple that is here this morning. And we just clapped and turned around like everybody else. Well, guess what? After the service, one of the armor bearers tapped us on the shoulder and said, guess what? Y'all are that couple. And y'all don't understand that God can do it. Can I tell you another testimony? Uh, a few months ago, my wife was was going down a different uh, 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 equivalent entrepreneurial stream in her business. Is that a good way to say it? And, and, and another person who was down that same stream said, you know what? Not only am I going to so bountifully lead you into you financially, but I'm also going to give you the equipment that you need in order to take this next step of faith. I need somebody to understand that the devil is overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. The enemy is not fighting you, but the enemy is fighting you to keep from telling people how good God is. Somebody shout hallelujah. Can I tell one more and I'm going to move on? About about 2010, maybe 2009, about 2010 or 2009, for my, my son Joshua became very ill. He became very ill, but 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 we took him to the hospital, Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital affiliate, which is supposed to be the best hospital in the world. And they said his kidneys have to come out. God didn't say that. God said the boy is dehydrated. The doctor said his kidneys have to come out. They pressed us. They threatened to call social services on us. They, 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 they cornered us. They cornered her in one room, cornered us in another room. Why won't you let us take this boy's kidneys? Why? And the only thing we said was, I don't know. Because that's not what the Lord said. I don't know. But the Lord hasn't told us that this boy needs his kidneys taken out. So how about we do this after a whole bunch of trauma and drama? I'm giving you the short version. After a whole bunch of trauma and drama, it's like, call us an ambulance so that we can take him to another hospital. Ambulance driver pulled up and said, what is wrong with y'all? Your son is in the best medical facility in the world. Why are you taking your son out of here? Y'all must have bumped your head. No wonder they were threatening to call social services on you. But that's not what God said. So they put him in an ambulance, took him down to Washington, D.C. We lived in Columbia, Maryland at that time. Took him down to Washington, D.C. to Washington Hospital Center. He got to Washington Hospital Center. The doctors examined him, said nothing wrong with this boy's kidneys. He's just dehydrated. Y'all not hear me up in here. Y'all not hear me up in here. The devil is overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. That which God has spoken, he's able to perform. You've got to listen to what God is saying. Somebody shout hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil's trying to shut you up. Tell somebody on one side, the devil's trying to shut you up. But is there anybody here who can declare, no, I won't shut up? I need you to understand that, yes, the devil is at war with you. But as they say on G Praise, it's a fixed fight and you've already won. Tell somebody you've already won. I need somebody to understand that the enemy is literally fighting you and me over our testimony. You may not remember the chapter and verse of every scripture you ever heard, but the old folks used to say it like this, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Is there anybody here who you may not know the address of every scripture, but you do remember what he's done for you. You do remember the ways that he's made. You do remember the doors that he's opened. Look at somebody say, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. That's why the Jews in the fall have a time called the days of remembrance where they just remember what God has done for them. Is there anybody here who can lift your hands and say, God has done too much for me? Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Father. And guess what, Melvin? Your testimony is not just for other people, Amen. but your testimony is for you too. Because when the enemy comes in like a flood, you've got to remind yourself about ways God made. This is not your first time being broke. This is not your first time your money's acting funny. This is not your first time your air conditioner's been on the fridge. This is not the first time your children been tripping. But when you look at your spiritual resume, the same God that fixed your AC before, the same God that made money come before, the same God that fixed your marriage before, is the same God who can do it again. The devil wants you to doubt your testimony, but your testimony is proof positive that if he did it before, he can do it again because he's the same God right now. Now, somebody shout hallelujah. The devil is warring against the children of God. 
because he wants us to believe that the things our daddy has said and the things that our daddy has done are not true and to finally stop talking up about our God. But I need somebody to know that everything in your life is attempting to yell louder than the almighty God. But guess what? Our testimony turns down the volume of the enemy. I need somebody just to yell out for about 30 seconds something that God did in your life because our testimony turns down the volume of the enemy because the power of life and death is in the tongue. Somebody shout hallelujah. But let me understand that testimonies promote victory. Somebody's testimonies promote victory. The Bible says this in Psalm 119 and 38 because even the psalmist in Psalm 119 and 38 got discouraged because he wrote this. He said, reassure me that your promises for, are for me. Anybody ever been there? Yes. Anybody ever been there? Yes. It, it, it's in, it, you can believe the promises are for Pastor Marvin and Pastor Deborah. You can believe that the promises are for the ushers and the praise and worship team. You can believe the promises are for somebody else. But is there anybody here who's ever had to say, God, reassure me? Oh that your promises are for me. For I trust and reverence you. Well, let me come to tell you that my job this morning is to reassure somebody that his promises are for us. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 verse 39 that this promise is for you and your children and for all who will fall off, for all whom the Lord will call. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 and 21, it says as for me, this is God talking, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you you will not depart from you and my words that I put in your mouth will always be on your lips and the lips of your children and the lips of your descendants from this time more and forevermore. Tell somebody he's trying to reassure you about the promises. Isaiah 64 and 4 it, it reads a little bit something like this. It, it, I'm sorry, not Isaiah 64 and 4. Uh, uh, Romans 8 and 38 it reads a little bit something like this. It says, and now I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor light, neither anger angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our fears for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I'm just trying to reassure somebody about the promises of God. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 3 and 20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within. I need you to touch somebody and tell them God is able to do. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask, imagine, or think according to his power. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So, so this morning, this morning, this morning, I, I, I just want to give you a couple of things that God is going to make into your testimony. I, I want to give you just a few things that God is going to make into your testimony. Elroy, your neighbor, tell him I'm about to have a testimony. The, the first testimony that God is going to give somebody this morning is that he's able to deliver. Is there anybody here who can say, I know that's right already, that he's able to deliver. The Bible says in Daniel 3 and 17 that those three Hebrew boys said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Is there anybody here who believes that God is able to deliver you from whatever you're going through and whatever you're faith? He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And then they go on in verse 18 and say that even if he does not do it, guess what? He's still able. Is there anybody here with a still able testimony? Even if he doesn't come through in the way that I want him to come through, somebody shout, he's still able. Daniel chapter 6, verse 20. When the king, you know, they threw Daniel on the lines. It says, when the king got there, he called out in anguish. Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered in verse 22. He says, my God sent the angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I've been found innocent in his sight and I have not wronged you. Tell somebody he's able to deliver. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, it says, look across at the outposts of those pages. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps the Lord will help us, but nothing, somebody say nothing. nothing. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or whether he has few. In the King James, it just says it like this, God can save by many or God can save by few. Is there anybody here who can say, I don't care whether he sends an army or I don't care whether he sends one, but I know that he can deliver. If I'm talking to you, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. 
Isaiah 59, 15 through 16. Isaiah 59, 15 through 16. It says truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. It means that the devil goes after those who don't follow him. It says the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. And he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So look what it said. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. In other words, God said, guess what? If there's nobody else that I ask to help you, if there's nobody else willing to do what I ask them to do, God says, I'll do it myself. I don't know who I'm talking to, but is there anybody here who believes that God's going to give you a testimony that he's able to deliver? As a matter of fact, don't go your neighbor tell he is able to deliver. But not only is he able to deliver, but I don't know who this testimony is for, but God's going to give somebody the testimony that he is able to heal. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 30. Matthew chapter 15, verse 30. Can y'all put that up on the screen? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 30. It says, a vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. Somebody shout, he healed them all. Look at your name and say, whatever your condition, God can heal it. Whatever your condition, God can make you whole again. Look at Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. Luke chapter 5, verse 12 through 14, 14, 13. It says, in one of the villages, Jesus met in a man with an advanced case of leprosy. He had leprosy, stage four. Leprosy. And it says, when the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him and said, I am, I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. I need you to tell somebody that God is able to heal. John chapter 5, verse 14. It says, afterwards, Jesus found the man in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went out, verse 15, and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed them. Elbow your neighbor, say, once God does it, you need to let people know that it was Jesus who did it. Tell somebody on the side, say, once God does it, you need to let people know that it was Jesus who did it. Look at Psalm 147 and 3. It says, he heals the broken heart. Somebody shout Hallelujah and bandages up their wounds. Exodus 15, 26, look at what it says. Exodus 15, 26, it says, and, and, he, and he said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right, and will keep his ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, then none of the diseases that I put upon the Egyptians will I put upon you, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. I need somebody to lift your hands and declare that he's a healer. I need somebody to lift your hands in this room and declare that he is a healer. Somebody say, he is the Lord that healeth me. There is no issue that's bigger than the God that we serve. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And not only is God a healer, but God wants to work healing through you and me. The Bible says one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and he gave them power and authority to cast out demons and to heal all diseases. Somebody lift your hands and say, you have the authority to cast out demons and you have the authority to heal. But here's the thing. Not only is God going to give you a testimony that he's able to deliver. And not only he's going to give you a testimony that he's able to heal, but he's also going to give us a testimony. And somebody already has this testimony that he's able to keep you from stumbling. Is there anybody here other than me who knows that there's been more than one occasion where the, the, the devil has put the banana peel of temptation in your life, but some way, somehow, God didn't allow you to fall for it. He kept you from stumbling. Is there anybody here who can say he keeps me from stumbling? Jude chapter 1 verse 24 says, all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy and into his glorious presence without a single fall. Tell somebody, that's a good God right there. Not only is he able to keep me from falling, but he can bring me into his presence without a single fall. Look at your name and say, because I have some faults, but God cleans me up so well that by the time I get into his presence, none of my faults show. In, 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 in other words, in other words, how can I say this? Beloved, God doesn't see us as we are. God sees us as we will be. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
Psalm 27 and 2 says this. Psalm 27 and 2 says this. When evil people come to devour me, when they try to make us stumble, God says, I will flip and reverse ah. that thing. He says, when my enemies and my foes attack me, looking forward to me stumbling, God says, I'm going to flip it and reverse it in such a way that they will stumble and yes. fall. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. But I got two more and they will be gone. Three more, they will be gone. But God is able to aid you. Somebody say, he's able to aid me. All right. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. It reads like this. It reads like this. It says, because he himself suffered, when he is tempted, when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Somebody needs to lift your hand and say, he's able to help me. Is there anybody here who knows that God has tempted you, that the enemy has tempted you on more than one occasion, but God helped you when you were tempted? If I'm talking to you, shout hallelujah. That's why David says in Psalm 120 and 121 and 2, he says, my help comes from the Lord. Is there anybody here with that testimony? My help doesn't come from the government. My help doesn't come from the mayor. But my help comes directly from the Lord God Almighty. And God is not only able to help me, but God is able to make all grace abound. Oh, somebody missed that. Somebody missed that. 2 Corinthians verse chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. It says, and God is able. Somebody say able. able. To make all grace abound toward you. Is there anybody here who can thank God for his grace? Yes. That you always have all sufficiency in all things and have an abundance for every good work. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a grace on my life to release the glory of God. Tell somebody on the side, say, there's a grace on my life to release the glory of God. And he says it like this in the NLT version. It says, each time he's in, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, I'm getting all ahead of myself this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says, each time he said, my grace is all you you need. Oh, somebody missed that. How many of you know that it's his grace? How many know that you wouldn't have made it without his grace? He said, my grace is all you need. I need you to elbow somebody and say, thank God for this amazing grace. Thank God that his grace is all I need. Is there anybody here who's ever been in that grace is all I need situation that you prayed for God to change the circumstance? You prayed for God to change the situation, but God says, I'm not going to yet change the circumstance. And I'm not going to yet change the situation, but I'm going to flood you with grace. Is there anybody here who can thank God for the flood of grace? When you look back over your life and people say, how did you make it through what you went through? You can look back and say, the only way I made it was because of his grace. He says, because my power works best in your weakness. Oh, somebody's not hearing me again. He says, so Paul says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. I need somebody to say, thank God for his grace. I need somebody else to say, thank God for his grace. Got two more, beloved, then I'll be out of here. I'll be out of here on this rainy day. So let's review. Somebody say, God is able to deliver. God is able to deliver. God is able to heal. God is able to keep me from stumbling. God is able to aid me. God is able to make all grace abound around me. I love this one. This is my favorite one, Melvin. This next to last one. God is able to open doors. Somebody missed that. I need y'all to say that with me. Say it out loud. God is able to open doors. Somebody say it a little louder. God is able to open doors. Somebody say it a third time. God is able to open doors. Is there anybody here this morning who needs some doors open in your life? I need you to know that it's not your resume that's going to open the doors. That it's not your degree, your fraternity, or your sorority that's going to open doors. It's nice to have all those things, but I need you to know that at the end of the day, it's the mighty God we serve who's going to open the door that you need to have open. Is there anybody here who's ever seen God open a door? Elbow your neighbor and say, God is getting ready to open up some doors for you. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I believe that somebody's word right there. Somebody's been waiting for a door to be open. If that's your word, you better grab it and shout hallelujah and say, that's for me, that's for me, that's for me. Tell somebody, God is going to open
open some doors. Shout hallelujah. Look at this, Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Verse 7, it says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true and the one who has the key of David. What he opens, oh my goodness. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. What he opens. Somebody missed that. What he opens. Somebody missed that. What he opens. No one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. Oh, 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 can I break this thing down? In other words, God wanted me to stop by and tell somebody that when he opens this door, don't you worry about putting a door stop there. Don't you worry about how you're going to keep it open. Because if God opened it up, he's going to keep it open. Tell somebody, I'm about to walk in to something great. I'm about to walk in to something awesome. Oh, 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 oh. Look at his name and say, so why has it been so long getting the door open? God said, I had to let you try the door. I had to let you shake the door. I had to let you shimmy the door. I had to let you call people to see if they could open the door. Because God said, I want to make sure that when the door opened, the only person that you could give glory, the only person to whom you could give honor was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Look at your neighbor and say, God is going to open this door. God is going to make this way. Somebody, anybody, everybody, shout hallelujah. And guess what? Tell somebody, you don't have to worry about your past chasing you through this door. Because he says, and that which I close, tell somebody it stays closed. Tell somebody, oh, 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 oh. That means you can't go back and open it up either. Don't you dare go on Facebook looking up your old boyfriend. Looking up your old girlfriend. Trying to see what they're up to these days. Tell somebody that door is closed. Most of us can't enjoy the open door because we're mourning over the closed door. But you better say like they say in Jamaica, so long, bye-bye. Look at them say, so long, bye-bye. Tell somebody I got an open door. Tell somebody I got an open door. Are y'all ready for this one? I, I need my open door crowd. Where y'all? Where y'all? Because y'all kind of quiet this morning, but that's okay. But I just need my open door crowd to holler back at me. Open door, raise your hand and holler back at me. Look at this. Look at this. Tell somebody my open door. Tell somebody my open door. Isaiah 43, 13. Look at this. It says, from eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. But wait for it, wait for it. No one can undo what I've done. Oh, y'all not hearing me over here. If God gave it to you, if God opened the door for you, if God made a way for you, no one can undo what he's done. Tell somebody it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Don't you worry about it. It may look like it's going away. It may look like it's drying up, but it is not. God's just working on a new testimony for you because no one can undo what he's done. No one can undo what he's done. Somebody's going to get this. No one. I cannot do what he's done. Yeah. Wow. Let me park here for a second. No do you think that God did all that he did to deliver you, to save you, to get you in the house, to get you on the job, to let one person show up and undo what he's done? Absolutely not. I need somebody to holler. No one can undo what God's done. If you believe it, I need you to shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Says it like this in the NIV. It says, yes. And from ancient of days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Look at somebody say, God's about to act. And when he acts, nobody can reverse it. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to up in here? You need to understand that God is able to open the door. Somebody shout, he's able to open the door. Look at him and say, I'm running to the open door. Y'all know we use this example a lot. You'll go to Publix after service. You'll go to Win Dixie after service. You'll go to Target. Like, yeah, they have, they, they have one at Target. Yeah. You'll go to Target after service to pick up a little something, something for the family. 
And because it's a cloudy day, as you walk to the store, it's going to look like it's closed. Because the windows are tinted, you're going to wonder if they're open. But what you're going to do is you're going to keep on walking toward that door. And when you get in sense of range of that door, guess what? The doors are going to go, shh. They're just going to slide open. I need somebody to understand that you need to keep walking with Jesus. Because if you keep walking with Jesus toward the destination that God has for you, those doors will open. Is there anybody here who's ever seen God open a door? Is there anybody here who's ever seen God made a way? Elbow somebody. Say, I'm sorry for keeping elbow on you. The forehead preacher asked me to do it. But you need to know that God is opening doors. Somebody shout hallelujah. Look at this, Revelation 3 and 8. It says, I know all the things you do. Uh -huh. Y'all miss that. Y'all miss it. Tell somebody, I don't always get it right. God says, I know all the things that you do. And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Somebody missed a great place to shop right there. God said, I see, mm, can I go old school for 35 seconds? Do you really think that God brought you this far to leave you right now? Do you really think that God brought you this far to drop you right now? What kind of God do you think he is? Elbow somebody said, God won't do you like people. He says, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close. Thankfully, not even us. He said, I know you got little strength. I know you've worn out. He said, but you obeyed my word and did not deny me. In other words, he says, because of your testimony, because you kept on talking me up, God says, I'm going to open this door for you. Understand, brother, that your testimony of how able God is, your testimony of the way God's made is the reason why God opens doors. You see, when you act like everything you had came by your own hand, God doesn't know under no obligation to do more for you. But when you let people know that it's because of God that you have what you have and you are where you are. God says I can trust you with more. Look at them say an open door, an open door, an open door. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. One, one more story then I'm going to go to my last point. Hallelujah. When my wife and I bought our house, our la the house that we live in now, we were on our way to the furniture store. We were excited. We were on our way to the furniture store. Tell somebody on our way to the furniture store. At the room store, getting ready to go in out we're in the room store, pick out furniture for our new house. And guess what? what? The phone rang. Uh -oh. And it was the builder's lending agent. And she said, guess what? We can't do the deal. You must be crazy. We at the furniture store, about to buy furniture. She's like, we can't do the deal. Hung up the phone. My wife said, what are we going to do now? We will go in the furniture store because we know what God said. God said, I'm able to save by many or by few. If God chooses not to use her, that's her bad because she can't be a part of this miracle. Y'all not hearing me up in here. But long story short, on the day we were supposed to go to closing, we went to closing. On the day we were supposed to move in, we moved in because God had opened the door. Somebody doesn't understand what I'm saying here. I need somebody to lift your hands and say, God, I believe you for an open door. Tell somebody I got a testimony. Tell somebody I got a testimony. Tell somebody I got a testimony. Someone say, I got a testimony that he's able to deliver. I have a testimony that he's able to heal. I have a testimony that he's able to keep me from falling. I have a testimony that is able to aid me. I have a testimony that is able to make all grace abound. I have a testimony that is able to open doors. But finally, 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 mm. I have a testimony, Melvin, that he is able to save to the uttermost. Is there anybody here who knows that he's able to save? Is there anybody here that knows that not only is he able to save your soul one time, 
but he's able to save your behind time after time after time. Is there anybody here who can say, that's my story, preacher? That's my story. Is there anybody here who knows that he's able to save? I need the big fish just to stand up for 30 seconds. I need the people who you know that God had to pull. God had to do a work to get you saved. God had to do a work to get you right. You, you see, some of us, some of us, there was no surprise when we got saved. But for the others of us, when we came to the family reunion and we told folks we were saved, they said, no, you're lying. Go on over there to the Johnny Walker Red Table. You said, but no, I'm saved. Are there any big fish in the house? Look at your neighbor and tell them I was a big fish, but God got me saved. I was a hard head, but God got me saved. How did he do it? Because he's able to save. To the utmost, somebody shout hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Yo, you see, I'm almost done. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. It says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Tell somebody, save completely. Save. Look at somebody say, I am saved completely. Titus 3 and 5 says this. It says, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. Is there anybody here who can thank God for his mercy? He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Spirit. 1 John 2 and 12 says this, and I love this, I love this, I love this. John is writing to some newly saved folk, and this is what he says. He says, I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. But, but then he says, he says this in verse 13. He says, I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. Then he says, I'm writing to you who are are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. Hallelujah. I need somebody to shout hallelujah right there. Hallelujah. Look at your name and say, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like, but I've won my battle with the evil one. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, I write to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I write to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I write to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your heart and you have won your battle with the evil one. I need somebody who will understands that God has saved you and understands that God has made you victorious. I need you to give the Lord a hand of praise. I need you to give the Lord some glory up in this place. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody give God the glory. Second Samuel 14, 14 says this. He says, like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, God devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. Is there anybody here who can thank God that he made ways for you to get saved? That he made ways that you didn't have to stay on the outside? That he made ways for you to be able to come in from the rain? Tell somebody, God is able to save to the uttermost. Look at Psalm 143 and 1. Psalm 41. Oh, I'm sorry. Isaiah 59 and 1. It says, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you. I need somebody here to know that. God's arm is not too weak to save you. Elbow your neighbor. Say, if he saved me, he can save you too. God doesn't have a weak arm, but God has a strong arm. Is there anybody here who knows that you've been saved through the strength of the almighty God? Psalm 143 and 11. It says, Lord, saving me. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. No, we get ready to close. Get over here, please, sir. It says, Psalm 143 and 11. It says, Lord, saving me will bring glory to your name. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here, even if your soul is saved, who needs God to rescue you out of a circumstance? Who needs to rescue you out of a situation? I need you to lift your hands and declare and say, Lord, saving me will bring glory to your name. Somebody say it again. Say, Lord, saving me will bring glory to your name. Somebody say it again. Say, Lord, saving me will bring glory to your name. Understand what you're saying. You're saying, Lord, when you bring me out of this, Lord, when you deliver me out of this, I'm not going to act like I had all the answers. I'm not going to act like I had all the solutions. But when you bring me out, God, I'm going to testify that my back was against the wall and it looked like it was over. But you showed up and you made me a way, made a way for me. Is there anybody here who can declare, God, when you bring me out of this, I will testify. God, when you 
deliver me from this. I will bring glory to your name. Bring me out of this trouble. Why? Because you are true to all your promises. I need you to elbow somebody and tell them he's a promise keeper. He's a promise keeper. He's a promise keeper. I want to there two or three people. I want to there four or five people. I want to there about six or seven people who can pop up on your feet and declare he is a promise keeper. He is a promise keeper. Everything that he promised, he has performed. Is there anybody here who can declare he is, he is, he is a promise keeper, a promise keeper. He put food on my table. He put clothes on my back. He put spits into my head. He's kept it day after day. Is there anybody here who knows that he is a promise keeper? Testimony. I have a testimony 
that he's made all grace abound. I have a testimony that he's able to say to the uttermost. Say, blow. I already have that testimony. Guess what? God's going to multiply your testimony in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you believe in these words, that going to be even on this week. The most high God is going to multiply my testimony. Find somebody and say, I, I'm sorry for annoying you all so But when you see me next week, I'm going to have two new testimonies. Oh, oh, look back at it and say, and it's going to be just the testimony you need to hear. Woo. Every eye's closed. Every eye's closed. Of all the things that God is able to do, I'm most grateful that he's able to save to the uttermost. While every eye is closed, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, won't you put your hand up? I just want to pray over you right now in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, just raise your hand. I just want to pray over you. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning, you're saved, but you don't have a church home, just raise your hand. I just want to pray over you. Every eye is closed. Saved, but don't have a church home. God bless you. I'll see your hand. If you're here this morning, you're saved. I have a church home, but you and the Lord, you had a close walk with the Lord, but somehow it fell off. Raise your hand if you want to get back with Jesus. Get back into that good place with Jesus. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I just want to pray over you. And finally, if you don't have a church home or if you're looking for a church home, I want you to raise your hand. Or it's not working where you are, I want you to raise your hand. I just want to pray over you. Listen. 